We are here live with the seven-time Emmy Award winner, Roy Firestone. You've also been a Cable Ace Award recipient as well. I just want to ask you, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are you today? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Good. Here. good to hear you're doing well. It's good to have you. My pleasure. I've known about you for quite some time. You know, you've been in the entertainment industry for years. Mm -hmm. And I, I must say, I, I've been a huge fan of what you've been doing as far as like with ESPN and on Jerry Maguire. Mm -hmm. And the way you interview people, it's, 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 just, it's, it's great for me because I'm going into sports journalism, so I learn a lot from different people. Mm -hmm. That's good to hear. Um, yeah, but you're one of the people that I admire, so uh, it's definitely a pleasure to have you. It's a pleasure to be here. It really is. So let's kind of go back on your career. Um, when was your realization that you realized sports journalism was going to be your future? Well, it's an interesting story because I was a kid growing up in Miami Beach, Florida, and uh, I, was, I loved baseball, and we didn't have baseball back when I was growing up. I mean, we didn't have professional major league baseball. Now, of course, the Marlins are there. I live in California now. But I always dreamed of being somehow affiliated with a baseball team in some respect because I was a big baseball fan. And I basically talked my way into becoming a bat boy for the Baltimore Oriole baseball team when they trained down there for two seasons. And when I had a chance to meet all the players and know the players – and hang out with them in the locker room and drive the buses with them and eat with them. I said, boy, I would love to do something where I could take all of these great experiences and make a living out of it. Maybe being an interviewer, maybe being a sports reporter or an anchor. Um, and that's exactly what happened. This was what, what I'm talking about when I was bat boy, I was about 16 or 17. And within, you know, six, seven years later, I was on the air in Miami as a sports anchor. And I went from there to California, and in California, I got the opportunity to be an interviewer for a show called, first, first of it, first show was called Sports Look on the USA Network. That grew into Up Close, which was on ESPN for, gee, parts of four different decades. So I knew when I was in those locker rooms that I wanted to have something to do with being around sports people. And maybe, just maybe being some sort of a journalist. I didn't want to be a disc jockey per se. There were a lot of those. I wanted something better. And I never thought I was going to be an interviewer until the opportunity came to me. So first I started as a sports anchor in Miami. And uh, I was pretty raw. But I, 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 you know, if you do it long enough and you, you, you gain confidence, um, opportunities can present themselves both in print and in broadcast. And I, and I think I was lucky and fortunate enough to have those opportunities. And for you, you know, I know you've enjoyed it throughout your career. Mm -hmm. and what would you say would be some of your memorable experiences? Oh, I did 5,000 interviews. And before we even talk about Jerry Maguire, um, well before Jerry Maguire, I had an opportunity to interview everybody from Miles Davis figure that one out because he wasn't known as a sports figure, loved sports, by the way, loved the boxing particularly. I had a chance to interview Richard Nixon on the show, uh, even sh short interviews with Madonna. And uh, let's see, we, we had Jerry Seinfeld on those shows, plus, you know, about 5,000 sports figures in the course of all, all of the years. So it's been an unbelievable, exciting run for me in doing all of those things. But I would say one of the highlights was interviewing Nixon. I would say that would be high on my list in terms of, you know, no one got a chance to really interview Nixon after Watergate. And I did. And he, we did really well together. We talked only baseball for the most part, although I slipped in a few questions about forgiveness and stuff like that. And it was, he was good. Um, I, I didn't agree with his politics, but I certainly appreciated his generosity and his time. And he gave me a lot of time. Um, also, you know, Jerry Maguire was, was a thrill for me because I didn't expect anything of it. When they called me to do it, they wanted to do a parody of the fact that Roy makes him cry, which is not really true. Let me cry, had, Roy. Don't make me cry, Roy. I had a lot of that. But I didn't have what I thought was, you know, the kind of name recognition or whatever to make that character or, or Roy Firestone character in the movie come to life. But the script was a lot of ad libs. And Cuba Gooding Jr. and I ad-libbed a lot of that scene. And it turned into one of the biggest things that ever happened in my career, having an opportunity to talk to people 
every day people saying, don't make me, just like you did, don't make me cry because they saw the movie. And the movie is really iconic. It's, it won Academy Awards and all kinds of stuff like that. But I can tell you that that was really a, a huge thrill. Plus, Tom Cruise was the first person I met on the set that day, and he was a big sports fan too, so it broke the ice immediately. So I would say a lot of that stuff was really thrilling for me. I was fortunate enough to win a bunch of awards. Um, you know, I, I really say fortunate because sometimes it's just opportunities presenting themselves and not everyone gets those opportunities in life. And I was just fortunate that I was one of them. So, I, you know, all things considered, I, ha I had a lot of great moments in doing what I do. You know, I get some disappointments. Everybody does. But for the most part, it's been, a, it's been an amazing, exciting run for me. And I love doing what I do. So you've been on ESPN from the 80s to 94. <laughs> Actually, as far back as 79, really. Okay. I had a, they, well, there was an old ESPN before the new one came about. So I, went, I started a show at ESPN, the very beginning of ESPN, like 78, 79. I went 79 through 80, 90s, and even to the 2000s. So parts of four different decades. And as you mentioned, you know, it's, it's been a great ride for you to be able to do uh, such great things. And then mm -hmm. also, too, you did a voice in uh, for Daffy Ducks. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I also did the Sim. I was in the Simpsons. Um, you know, the thing is, I always dreamed of being a voiceover artist too. I, 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 I love doing the Flintstones. Um, I, I, I used to draw the, my nickname as a kid was Flintstone instead of Firestone. Mm -hmm. And I used to draw the Flintstones too. And, uh, so I had an opportunity very early on to get involved with the voiceover work. And I'm still doing it as, as we speak to, up to today. Um, sometimes the animation, sometimes just commercials, sometimes one line, sometimes 10 lines. But um, that was also an, um, an amazing thing for me to be able to do cartoons and play myself or play characters. I, did, I do a lot of uh, celebrity impressions and I've had a chance to you know, use them. And in, in one of them was uh, the Daffy Duck thing you were talking about, the Bugs Bunny. I did a Howard Cosell before your time, but Howard Cosell as a duck. Wow. Yeah, and so that worked out great for me. I really enjoyed doing that. And it was sort of a dream come true for me because I got to work with a guy named Mel Blank. Mm -hmm. You guys should Google it, B-L-A-N-C. Yes. Man, he was the legend of legends. He was the voice of Daffy Duck. He was the voice of Bugs Bunny, the voice of Porky Pig. And I don't know, maybe a thousand characters. He played them all. And Mel Blanc was a legend and a hero of mine, and I got to work with him on his last project ever for television. Pretty cool. Now, you mentioned impressionist. Uh, you are an impressionist as well as being a voice actor as also being mm -hmm. a sports uh, host, a journalist. Now, you've got a knack for being a great impressionist, and you're talented in that. Thank now, you. one of your dear friends, Danny Gans. Oh, yeah. How, how has Danny Gans been... And, and, and you know, an inspiration to you, or, or uh, such a, a big influence to you? I well, know, I know he does a lot of. Um, yeah, well, he passed away about seven or eight years ago, maybe more. Um, and Danny was on my show. Um, we did we did trading impressions. We did uh, we did that. the I don't know if you saw it, but we did the national anthem. Danny Gans was a legend. Saw that. Uh, he sadly died. Uh, he had a medical. Um, medication mix in his body and he had a heart attack it was terrible but Danny was a friend of mine Danny came on the show and Danny and I were, were very very friendly and he was a tremendous impressionist he did a lot of singing impressions too I do a lot of singing impressions and I've been doing that for corporations and for groups all over the country for the last 30 plus years been doing it and uh, I love to sing also in my regular voice so it, and I use sports too by the way it's not just Roy's going to do an impression of Robert De Niro or something, but he will, I, I use the sports as the through line throughout the show about using sports and then having celebrities in it. So I, you know, I, it's just been an amazing, exciting run for me to be able to do all of these different things. You know, I was just reading a piece about uh, Kyle Petty, the race car driver. He wanted to be a singer and he did, he sang, he opened for a number of acts and he got a kick out of it. And people say, you know, Kyle, you're really a race car driver it, you should only do that. And I can relate because people said to me, you know, you should only be a sportscaster. It's confusing for people. 
I don't know. I don't think that it really is that big of a reach. It's still entertainment sports. And, and in my case, uh, entertaining on stage for corporate groups. So I really had a chance to do that for a long time, still doing it. And right now, of course, with the coronavirus, not a lot of shows are being done, but when this thing hopefully is over, uh, the business will come back. I don't know when that will be, but I do really feel like I've had a big, big canvas in my career, in my life to do many different kinds of things. And it, it, uh, it's been thrilling. I got to perform with um, Loretta Lynn, the country legend, Michael McDonald of the Doobie Brothers. I got to per, uh, perform with uh, Lou Rawls, a legendary blues singer. I got to perform with Josh Groban and the Four Tops and David Foster, Reba McIntyre, all of them. And it was really kind of a thrill to do all those things and have to, to have a stage. And my clips are all over YouTube. You can look at them. One, of the, one night I got to do a show uh, with Reba McIntyre. She introduced me, as a matter of fact. And I did a thing, a tribute to Muhammad Ali, which is also on YouTube. And uh, it was a huge thrill for me. And I performed many, many, many shows with, with Muhammad Ali on stage, uh, I guess, across three different decades, really. And uh, that was an enormous, enormous thrill for me, too. Lionel Richie was performing and all these other different, you know, great, great. The, let's see, who was who else was it? Um, I think I forget the name of the other bands, but there were a lot of other bands there that night. And also John Bon Jovi was there that night. So I got to do a lot of shows using the same stage that those guys did. And it was pretty cool. Who would have to be your favorite uh, impression of yours that you would? Well, you know, it depends. Um, it depends if it's a spoken impression or a musical impression. It's kind of hard to do a musical impression without music here. But, you know, Mike Tyson was always one of my favorite people to, to do an impression of. You know, get, get a voice very, very much like that, you know, saying, I don't know what to say. I feel powerful. I feel extraordinary. I, I hit him with a left hand, a right hand, you know what I'm saying? I, that's what I was. You know, he talked like that. And how it goes, sell talk like that. And Muhammad Ali talk like that. I'm so great. I'm so fast and pretty. The greatest of all time. I hope Joe Frazier with George Foreman. I'm still great, still fast, and no one's going to beat me. I'm still greatest of all time. You know, I could do all those kind of impressions. But I do a musical medley in my show. And one of the things I do is I replace Paul McCartney and the Beatles on video um, when they perform for the Ed Sullivan show, the first time they have came to America. And we did it electronically where my head replaces Paul McCartney on stage singing. It's a pretty cool thing. It took us about two months to produce it. And I used to do that live in my show. So I, yeah, people say, well, are you a sportscaster? Are you a performer? I think I'm both, and I don't really think that one has to cancel the other one out. In your career, you know, what has been the key to your success? And if you weren't a sports journalist, uh, you know, if you weren't a broadcaster, what do you think your career would have been? Two parts. Number one, the key to my success is opportunity. If you get the opportunity and you make good on it, well, that's, that's really important. If you know, some people never get the chance. Some people don't really... Some people quit before they get the chance. Some people um, get despondent and disappointed and get rejected and they feel like they should do something else. The most important thing I could say is you just can't give up. I know it's a cliche, but it's so true in the broadcast business because you're going to get people who are better than you, not as good as you. You're going to get news directors and ho um, hosts uh, for shows and uh, executives and they're either going to like you or not like you and they'll work with you or not work with you, but you can't get too far down because sooner or later another opportunity could come your way. So I would say the key to my success was making good on opportunity. Um, the, the, the other part of the question, uh, if my career wasn't as a sportscaster or a performer, I don't know, man. I, 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 I never worked a day in my life to use the expression. I truly don't think I did. Um, I've had a ball, but I, I think I, I would try to do something that was really fun. I don't think I was, would be a particularly good office worker or executive for a company. Um, I do think I needed to be some, somewhere around people. And so maybe being a spokesperson for a company, maybe I could do that. But I like the idea of being able to create new things, both in sports broadcasting and um, in performing. So if I couldn't do this, 
I would be a little lost, but I'd find my way because I'm a person with a lot of enthusiasm and I, I think I'm very creative. So I, w- I would come up with something, I think. Now, before you got into sports broadcasting mm-hmm. uh, or just in general, who are some of your inspirations? Well, I always loved Howard Cosell. And again, that's a little bit before your, your guys' time. But for those who are watching this, they should Google that name, C-O-S-E-L-L, Cosell. Uh, he was a very courageous, outrageous uh, broadcaster who did a lot of shows, a lot of broadcasts with Muhammad Ali. Uh, he was certainly one. Uh, Ted Koppel later on was a big, big influence for me. A, people named, a person named Jack Whitaker from CBS Sports was a very important figure. Uh, some of my friends are definitely inspiring to me. People like Bob Costas, who still remains a close friend of mine. I think he's one of the very best who's ever done what he does. Uh, I always admire what he does. Um, Larry King, I grew up with Larry King in Miami. And so I got to see his interviewing styles. So those were some of the people, but I would, and also I think, you know, to tell you the truth, Oprah Winfrey, um, later in my life, I liked the way she, she parlayed her interviewing, her hosting of shows. And at the same time, Um, showed her own personality, her own advocacy on things. And I was always impressed with how she carried herself. So those are some of the people I would say. So presently, as you mentioned, you're still doing a lot in the entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. What are the future goals for you? Well, first of all, keep doing what I do, if I can. Uh, This because we're going through this very difficult time in America and really all over the planet, we don't really know what's going to be the future, for example, in sports, but also, and that's my business too, but also what's going to happen in the personal appearance performing arts world. We don't know when and if people are going to start taking seats again to see, would you want to sit next to somebody? You don't know what the story is, especially without a vaccine. That's one thing. But I've also, I I just signed on to do a a podcast. I'm going to do a national podcast. A lot of people have podcasts, but this is going to be a show that involves a lot of storytelling and my interviewing and my essays and some of my humor. And that's going to start in a couple of weeks. Then I have another opportunity with a streaming service uh, that's going to be doing my show for, yeah, shall we say a little bit older audiences, you know, the 60 and up, maybe the the the, the, the Medicare group the baby boomers who are getting a little older, that there's a market for that. I'm going to be doing a talk show called Legends, maybe a game show for them too. We're talking about that right now. And also I just love, I'm, I'm a bit of a blogger. I go on, on the uh, Facebook pages and I write my stuff every day. Some people agree with what I say, some people don't. But I, I enjoy writing too. I've written three books. I've recorded a CD a musical CD where I sing in my regular voice. That's also on YouTube. It's called Another Voice. And my third book is right here. I don't know if you can see this, but uh, it says, that's what I'm talking about. Is it backwards here for you too? Oh, I don't know. If it, I can see it. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, my, uh, that's my new book. And that's my third book. And the other two did really, really well. So I've been fortunate. I do a lot of things. And I hope to continue to do it and do it for... You know, I never want to retire. I'd like to continue to do this for as long as I can. And speaking of all the work that you've done, you've also had a chance to be on, uh, you know, the ESPN's uh, broadcast of football. Right. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that was an opportunity, too. That that was in the very early years. We did Sunday night football. Um, At the time, we brought a special guest in every week, and I had to interview them while the game was going. It was a little awkward, but it was kind of fun. I had people like Jim Brown and Roger Staubach and um, Larry Zonka and other people came on the show that we had that taught the broadcast during a game. So it was kind of interesting to try to get it in between plays. But uh, I did that for two years. That was the inaugural season for the NFL on ESPN, and I was very proud to, to be part of that. That was, that was a hoot. We also ran into the strike one year, and so we had – players we never heard of before on the field and that was that was a little different that was that was a challenge but I I had a chance to do a lot of things that I was very proud of and even I even had OJ Simpson believe it or not next to me in the booth doing a game with the 49ers so all I could say is you know I've had a pretty eclectic career I've done a lot of things I'm very proud of what I've been able to do 
Um, you make your mistakes. Everybody makes them. You make errors in judgment. But all, all in all, I'm pretty proud of what I've been able to accomplish in, in, the, in the years that I did it. And uh, as I said, I hope I can do it for as long as till, till I'm ready to go because I, I don't want to retire and I just enjoy what I do. I love people and I love the excitement of creating. And that's part of what I do. As far as your legacy, what would you like your legacy to be? Well, just that I, I really truly did the best I could in what I did. I know it's a corny thing to say, but I, I, I took my job seriously. I did some good work. I wrote some good pieces. I wrote some books. I maybe inspired people, maybe made people feel closer to the athlete or the celebrity I was talking to, uh, maybe had some degree of uh, influence on other young people in getting into the business. I was I get, had an opportunity to, to do things. I was opportunistic. But again, as I said at the top, if you don't have the chance, a lot of people don't get that chance. And I was just lucky I did. And I, I always, what we're doing now even, I believe it's important to share what, what you have with uh, aspiring, you know, young broadcasters and journalists like yourself. And I think it's important to give back. And I'd like to feel that that's part of my legacy too. Um, that I was, you know, also personally, from a personal standpoint, a, a good person. And uh, I cared about uh, those who had less than I did and tried to give back to my community. Those are all important things for a legacy and something I'm really proud of that I'm continue to do. And I'm hoping that I can do for a long time to come. Roy, it's been a pleasure interviewing you. Thank you, man. Thank you for taking the time. I wish you the very best of luck. Thank you, brother. Be good. Take care. Bye-bye now.